if you've been watching these uh, modules in the suggested order, uh, we have now finished the introductory uh, part of the course. Uh, we've covered cases on how to form an enforceable promise. We have uh, been introduced to a few cases on uh, defenses to enforcement and a couple cases uh, having to do with remedies. Now we're going to go back and take up in more depth uh, how to create enforceable contracts and starting again with the concept of consideration. In an earlier lecture, we talked about consideration as a traditional prerequisite for forming a contract. By introducing that uh, concept with the classic chestnut of a case, uh, Hammer versus Sid, uh, Sidway. You remember that was the one where an uncle bribed his nephew to refrain from drinking and using tobacco until he was 21. In Hammer, the court found that there was consideration. Today we consider a case called Kirksey versus Kirksey, where the court considered a promise that lacked consideration, in other words, a gratuitous promise. The defendant in Kirksey wrote a letter to the plaintiff, uh, Angelico Kirksey, his widowed sister-in-law, after he learned of his brother's death. He wrote, if you come down and see me, I will let you have a place to raise your family. Uh, the plaintiff had been squatting on public land, which she could have secured, but after receiving the letter, she abandoned the land and moved her children about 65 miles to live with the defendant. The defendant housed the plaintiff for over two years, but then forced her to leave. And the trial court uh, awarded the plaintiff $200, uh, but the instant court that we're going to be uh, uh, focusing on reversed. And so the central issue is simple. Was the defendant's promise supported by consideration? The court's opinion in this case is short and sweet. The opinion begins with what is in effect a one-sentence dissent by the authoring judge, who is inclined to hold that, quote, the loss and convenience which the plaintiff sustained in breaking up and moving to the defendants, a distance of 60 miles, is sufficient consideration to support the promise, unquote. The authoring judge, however, is outvoted, he's outnumbered by the other judges on the court who, quote, think that the promise on the part of the defendant was a mere gratuity and that an action will not lie for its breach, unquote. With that, the court reverses the lower court's opinion in uh, just three sentences and rules for the defendant. When we discussed Hammer versus Sidway, we concluded that the nephew's agreement to give up his a legal right to engage in certain vices counted as a legal detriment, as consideration because it was a legal detriment, and a detriment to the promiser counts as consideration. How about in this case? Was there a detriment to the promisee in Kirksey? Well, yes, she could have continued to squat on the public land and eventually secure it, but instead she abandoned the property and traveled 60 miles in reliance on her brother-in-law's promise. So if consideration is either a detriment to the promisee or a benefit to the promisor, the plaintiff seems like she should win, right? Well, wrong. Reliance alone is not enough. There must be a bargain, a quid pro quo. You remember that section 71 of the restatement second of contracts states that to constitute consideration, a performance or return promise must be bargained for. A promise for a return promise is bargained for if it's sought by the promiser in exchange for the promise and is given by the promisee in exchange for that promise. So was there a bargain for exchange in Kirksey versus Kirksey? No. At least the court, which called the promise a mere gratuity, not just a gr gratuity, but a mere gratuity, didn't seem to think so. Then again, it can be difficult to distinguish a conditional promise from a bargain for promise. For another example, imagine this offer is made. If you come to my house, you can play with my dog. Is the promiser bargaining with you to persuade you to visit? Or is the promis promiser simply saying, my dog's here, so if you happen to stop by, you can play with it? The latter is a gratuitous but conditional uh, gratuitous promise. Often we need extra facts to, to figure out whether a particular promise uh, 
is offering a quid pro quo uh, or offering a conditional gratuity. Was the sister's conduct in the Kirksey's case bargained for? Well, not if it was not sought by the promiser in exchange for the promise. But are we sure that it was not right? What if the promiser is Jewish and is, it's a mitzvah for him to marry the widow of his brother? Might he be willing to pay for her to come? Generations of law students have wondered about the story of Sister Antilico. Why did her brother-in-law invite her to come stay with him? Was the promise purely gratuitous or did he expect to get something out uh, from her, uh, out of her moving uh, closer to him? And why did he later change his mind and eject her from uh, his property? A 2006 article by William Casto and Val Ricks cast some light, uh, some new light on this question. They found that under federal law at the time, squatters on federal lands in Alabama and elsewhere were often able to obtain a preference on those lands that allowed them to purchase the lands at below market price. But the law only permitted one preference per person. So if the brother-in-law had already exercised a pre preference on other land, he may have sought to persuade Angelico to occupy the land and exercise a preference, buy it at a below market price, and then transfer it back to him. But if this is the story, why was Angelico evicted after two years? Casto and Ricks find records indicating that the brother-in-law, in fact, gave joint possession of the property to his son, who turned 21 around the time Angelico was ejected. Once he turned 21, the son was now of age and able to exercise the preference himself, making Angelico's continued occupancy unnecessary. These added details suggest that maybe Angelico's brother-in-law was, in fact, seeking a quid pro quo. In the lecture following Hammer v. Sidway, I talked about the case of Ricketts v. Scawthorne and introduced the doctrine of promissory estoppel. Promissory estoppel, you'll remember, allows courts to enforce promises even if there are not contracts because of lack of consideration. In Ricketts, remember, a grandfather promised his granddaughter that he would pay her $2,000 plus interest so that she would uh, uh, not have to go to work anymore. The grandfather the granddaughter quit her job, but after the grandfather died, the executor of the grandfather's estate refused to pay the promise $2,000. The court held that the promise was binding because the granddaughter relied on the promise to her detriment, and it'd be inequitable not to enforce it. Remember that Section 90 of the Restatement Second outlines the conditions for promissory estoppel. A promise which the promiser should reasonably expect to induce action or forbearance on the part of the promisee or a third person and which does induce such action or forbearance is binding if injustice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise. So did the brother-in-law's promise in Kirksey meet the requirements of promissory estoppel? Yes. A promisor who promises to give you a place to raise your family should reasonably expect that the promise will induce you to abandon the land you're squatting on and move uh, 65 miles. And in Kirksey, the promise did in fact induce the plaintiff to move. So why didn't the court enforce the promise? Well, the easy answer is that when Kirksey was decided in 1845, promissory estoppel was not yet a thing in contract law. Remember, Ricketts is recognized as one of the genesis cases uh, with regard to promissory estoppel, and it was not decided until 1898. Further, Kirksey was decided in Alabama and Ricketts was decided in Nebraska. Since the law changes over time and can differ from place to place, these factors might uh, simply explain the outcome. But I am not going to let you off with just the easy answer, nor would most law professors. You should also think of uh, if there are other ways that we can distinguish these cases factually to explain the outcome. One possible key difference is that the promisor in Ricketts had passed away, and the available uh, facts suggest that he still intended for the granddaughter to receive the gift. It was the executor of the estate who refused to pay. While this is, with this in mind, the question in Ricketts was arguably less about whether the grandfather's promise 
should have irre irrevocably bound him, and more about whether, how the grandfather's estate should be divided among the descendants. Since the grandfather apparently wanted his granddaughter wished for, uh, wanted his granddaughter's, what his granddaughter's wished for, his granddaughter to receive this money until his end, the outcome seems justified. But in Kirksey, it was the promiser who decided himself to take back his gratuitous promise. So with the doctrine of estoppel aside, the cases might also be reconciled by a rule that says an individual who makes a gratuitous promise may later or may later revoke or more easily revoke that promise, but he must do it himself or make his intention cl uh, to revoke posthumously clear to the court. Uh, even if both of these cases may come out the same today under Section 90, under this theory of promissory estoppel, and I tend to think they would, thinking through the factual differences in the cases is a useful exercise. This is what common law is frequently about, finding uh, potentially relevant factual distinctions in order to reconcile seemingly uh, unreconcilable uh, uh, and different outcomes. A clever lawyer will often find factual distinctions that allow her to argue that her client's situation is more similar to cases with outcomes more favorable and more distinguishable from outcomes that she doesn't like. So what have we learned? A conditional gratuitous promise does not create a contract. A contract requires bargain for exchange. So even if a promise induces the promisee to take or forbear from taking a certain action, the promise will not be an enforceable contract if that action was not sought by the promisor in exchange for his promise. Tobacco until he was 21. In Hammer, the court found that there was consideration. Today we consider a case called Kirksey versus Kirksey, where the court considered a promise that lacked consideration, in other words, a gratuitous promise. The defendant in Kirksey wrote a letter to the plaintiff. He talked about consideration as a traditional prerequisite for forming a contract by introducing that uh, concept with the classic chestnut of a case, uh, Hammer versus Sid, uh, Sidway. You remember that was the one where an uncle bribed his nephew to refrain from drinking and using fences to enforcement and a couple cases uh, having to do with remedies. Now we're going to go back and take up in more depth uh, how to create enforceable contracts and starting again with the concept of consideration. In an earlier lecture, we, uh, Angelico Kirksey, his widowed sister-in-law, after he learned of his brother's death, he wrote, if you come down and see me, I will let you have a place to raise your family. Uh, the plaintiff, had been squatting on public land, which she could have secured, but after receiving the letter, if you've been watching these uh, modules in the suggested order, uh, we have now finished the introductory uh, part of the course. Uh, we've covered cases on how to form an enforceable promise. We have uh, been introduced to a few cases on uh, defense.